drop the word. And God sometimes uses the visible so we can understand the spiritual. I was thinking about, I couldn't help but think, well, she brought that up today, of uh, one of her pastors uh, in Bolivia, La Paz, Bolivia, uh, the Salcedos, when they uh, were pastoring a church, um, the Lord spoke to them as they were struggling to see the church break through into another uh, realm of growth, uh, and they weren't quite being as effective. Um, and the Lord spoke to her with symbolic language and said, uh, you know, you've wanted to be an elephant, but I want you to be a mouse. And I couldn't help but think about that story. And, uh, and she, she said, Lord, but you want me to be a mouse? What are you talking about? I need to explain this. You want to be an elephant. You want to be seen by everybody, but I want you to be a mouse. An elephant can't get into every place, but a mouse can. And my destiny for you, my purpose is for you to reach every house in your city. Uh, with that was birthed the vision to go public with uh, TV shows and radio programs that they started. And today there are over 30,000, 32,000 people last night in their local church. They have 25 services on the weekend. They start Friday and they go through the whole weekend with different services. Uh, that is Ecclesia Church in La Paz, Bolivia and uh, Sister Salcedo Alberto and uh, Sylvia Salcedo heard that very clearly. You want to be an elephant, but I want to make you a mouse. God used a simple language that way to communicate his purpose and his thoughts. Well, um, whether you're a mouse or not, it, it's God who wants to use this church and get you to places, get you into the right place. So this morning, I thought as I prepare, there's something that God's been burning in my heart as I've traveled to different places. Uh, he, uh, I've been speaking a word called the epicenter. Everybody say the epicenter. Yes. And the epicenter, in its most simplest definition, is the point of origin from which all activity emanates. Everything starts in that epicenter. So all through, it's, uh, even in the geological world, uh, when we talk about earthquakes, a location where the earthquake originated, that point, uh, uh, it's the epicenter, where it started, where, where it began, where it was triggered off. It's called uh, the epicenter. Um, in, I was recently in New York, and Chinatown is the epicenter of the Chinese community in New York City. Everything that happens in, for the Chinese community happens in Chinatown, all the goods, all the food. And like that, we have uh, epicenters for almost every culture in a multicultural city like New York. Well, it's no different here as well. People gravitate to those epicenters where they can identify and where they feel comfortable with. Well, uh, in 9-11, I don't remember 9-11, Ground Zero, which is in New York City, was the epicenter of 9-11. It took place in the Pentagon as well. We have fields that an airplane came down the field, but the epicenter was New York. It's where it started, was the first attack, and that became the epicenter. And after that, all the ripples went through America. I remember Giselle and I being there. I was supposed to be there with Maverick. Uh, to show him the Twin Tower view on a clear day. It was a beautiful, clear day like today. And I had said to Erica the night before, let's go to the Twin Towers, be there at 8.30, so we don't have to make a long line. It's when the line opens, so we can go up to the tower. Well, if we would have gone, we would have lost our lives probably there. But God kept us. Barack, who was just recently born, woke up with a fever. And Erica calls me early in the morning and said, Dad, we're not going to be able to go. Barack is burning in fever. I think he's teething. And uh, so Barack saved our lives. Uh, uh, so we didn't go. And we said, that's okay. We'll go another time. There'll be another day. And shortly after that, we were going to be there at 30. She calls me around 7 something in the morning. Uh, to let me know we're not, we're, we can't go. And about 8.45 yeah. is when everything took place. Well, we would have been the first ones to take that elevator to the very view, tower view of, of uh, the, uh, the buildings. But God is good. God, God knows and he wants to have us in the right place at the right time. And what this message is all about is finding that right place for our lives. The epicenter where things are going to begin to happen. When Giselle spoke about our church and us starting our church. We started in an uptown, actually we started with a van of people 
uh, that we brought from different places to a, an address uptown in Washington Heights, New York, which is uptown New York. But it wasn't our place. And for two years, we were there, and our church struggled, and we gained people and lost people, and the people came and encouraged us, but then they left, and we felt this thing isn't going anywhere here, and it was struggling. Even our evangelism on the streets was a real struggle. It was like pulling teeth to get the church going. Until we remembered a prophetic dream that God had given my wife many years ago, where it took us to an address uh, where we decided to go, maybe that's the place. And we went to inquire of that. It was an old Methodist church where she grew up. And God showed her uh, us entering that Methodist church and showed the wall of the altar where there was a big cross, the back wall behind the pulpit. And uh, there was a hole in the dream, a hole came about. And behind that, we could see behind that wall, there was a group of people, a bunch of people worshiping God, lost in worship, and the music was loud, blasting, but we were on the other side of that looking at all these people worshiping. We forgot that dream, but that's exactly what happened. We went looking to see if they would rent the building because the church there was very old and the people were old and uh, they wanted something to happen, so we asked for their space. And they didn't rent us their main sanctuary, but they said, you know, behind this wall is a, a big space. It doesn't look good now, but if you guys come in there, we'll rent that space to you. And we looked at it, and it could fit maybe 200 people. So we rented that place. That was the birthplace of Hosanna. Mm -hmm. And we birthed Hosanna there. So if you would cut out within months, if you would have cut out a hole of that wall, you would have seen them. The, all the people worshiping, lost in worship, just like what we had here this morning. How many enjoyed the worship here this morning? Well, it's, a, it's an amazing thing because God comes, he dwells in the midst of the praises of, praises, praises of his people, and that's what happened. We were worshiping there, the church began to grow. It took off in a month, uh, uh, in a few months, we were a couple of hundred people, then it just took off again, and then we were 500, we couldn't meet there anymore. We had to have multiple services, then we went to another place, and we kept going to places. We even had a, a, a whole year, I think, that we did uh, kind of a gypsy thing. We went from neighborhood to neighborhood, wherever schools opened up to us, we would have our service. But we harvest the people of that community all through the different public schools that, that were open to us. And by that, we gained a, a place and a strong church that became a family called the Hosanna Church or Hosanna City Church. And from there is where all of these things began to happen. Churches that were planted, people that were strengthened, missionaries, and other works. Uh, and our ministry became uh, globally recognized by the word of the Lord and by the worship of our house. Before there was IHOP, before there was uh, uh, all of these different places uh, that today are doing an awesome job and have taken it way further than we have. Uh, there was a small church in Harlem that just got full of people, <coughs> worshiping people who love God with a great passion, a little close to a thousand people, and uh, maybe a little bit over a thousand, and uh, they were radical. We had three services, two morning services, and an afternoon Spanish service. But all of it, I say all of that for the glory of God, it's God who does those things. Uh, it wasn't anything that I inherited, uh, any grace, it was the grace of God on our lives as we obeyed God to find the epicenter. So that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit more. Uh, in heaven, there's an epicenter for everything. In heaven, God's throne is the epicenter of heaven. On earth, his presence is the epicenter. Come on. Wherever two or three are gathered, they are by. Uh, wherever there's worship, I abide in the midst of the praises of my people. So worship is becomes an epicenter. You find people who worship and God shows up. It's his yes. presence. That's the most yes. incredible, spectacular place on earth. It's the earth is full of beautiful places, castles and monuments and antiquities and new modern buildings, but nothing uh, can equal the presence of God in a place. When the presence of God comes in, people's lives get transformed. You can walk into museums and come out the same way you uh, walked in, but you can't walk into the presence of God and walk out the same way. Something happens. So the epicenter of, of earth is that uh, presence of God on earth, wherever his presence is manifest. In man, his spirit is the epicenter. In man, his spirit. The Bible says, 
Who knows the secrets of a man's heart except by the spirit of man that searches even the deep things of a man and even the deep things of the heart of God, the spirit. The spirit is the epicenter of a man. The, the scriptures also talk about the cross. The epicenter of God's love is the cross. Everything for us started with the cross. Started with the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary and his dying for us and shedding his blood. That's the epicenter. All our conversion, everything that takes place, our regenerating, our life change happens because of what Jesus did on Calvary. Can you give the Lord a big hand for what he did on Calvary? He died for us on Calvary. Well, in our bodies, again, if you look at it, the heart is the epicenter of our body. You don't take care of your heart. Physically, you can grow sick and you can die. I, we just came back from New York City. Uh, the last few days, we drove back because we, well, just Erica was very sick. Uh, we also had an emergency back home with my brother-in-law who caught a bacteria. That was the husband of Giselle's sis, well, young sister. He caught a bacteria in his heart and uh, doctors did not uh, diagnose correctly what he had. They didn't do the simple work of doing a, 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 a culture, blood culture. Uh, within seven months, all, they kept treating symptoms and instead of trying to find why those symptoms were there. They did no blood culture and a number of other tests that were very simple were basic. Uh, but he kept getting sicker and sicker, and I had seen him now before, now I see him, he's worse, and I insisted, you're going to the hospital now, we're taking you to a good emergency room where you're going to be taken care of. We took him to NYU, New York City, probably one of the best hospitals in the world, and there, within 24 hours, they found what he had. Found it was a bacteria, but the bad news was, it went to his heart. And it, it actually entered his heart and infected his heart, and he only had weeks to live if this wasn't taken care of. So they had to rush him into open heart surgery, which was uncalled for, if somebody would have detected that bacteria before time. And that bacteria could have gone to his brain and killed him. Uh, but in the heart, because we could, they caught it a few weeks before, they were able to eradicate it with antibiotics, strong, the right antibiotics, and were able to change all of the damaged parts of his heart. Um, and it was a quite intensive surgery, but he's up and alive, thank God. Amen. And he's well. Miguel, if you're hearing this, Amen. God bless you. Uh, you're on track and you're going to be stronger than ever yes. before. Amen. So uh, I'm saying that because some of us don't take care of our heart. The Bible says for some reason, uh, it should be very important to us what the Bible says, guard your heart because all the issues of life flow out of it. But we hardly ever think of our guarding our heart. We allow our heart to be open to all kinds of stuff, and people deposit all kinds of junk, and before you know it, we can even catch a bacteria that makes its way to our heart. And uh, something unseen uh, that poisons uh, our mind and our heart, yes. and we can end up with a very sick heart when we open our surgery, but our surgeon is the one who can do it and change it. Thank God he can change our hearts. How many of you have ever had your heart? infested with something that you knew God was not pleased with. Anger, pride, all kinds of things. We've all been touched by it. Thank God for Jesus who could, he's the great surgeon who can go in there and without tools fix us. Amen? Uh, so the epicenter, the epicenter of our mind is our conscience. And your conscience is where you deposit everything and store all the information you get. Well, everything is stored. You're probably the most powerful. You're more powerful than any computer ever invented. You, you might have the power to recall everything that's stored in your conscious, but everything is in your conscious, and we need to hit the delete button and delete some things uh, from our conscious constantly because they'll affect us as well. But it's we need to guard our conscious because the epicenter of our mind is our conscious and their thoughts that don't belong there, but the devil keeps bringing them up, and we need to eliminate them from our mind. But uh, the way you think is going to dictate what you do in life and where you end up in life. Whatever has your attention also will dictate uh, where you will arrive in life. So your conscience is very important when we speak of the mind. Uh, in the Bible, our Bible has an epicenter. Well, some have said, well, the center of the Bible is Psalm 133. It's the shortest Psalm, three verses, and that's the very center of, of you know, 30, um, one, 
1,173 or 72 verses in your Bible. That's the epicenter. No, the epicenter is not a, an address. The epicenter of the Bible is Jesus. When you find Jesus in your Bible, the Bible comes open because you have found the epicenter. You get the revelation of God and God's purpose. In the church, the Holy Spirit is the epicenter. Come on. And a church without the Holy Spirit is just a social club. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't matter if we're meeting in a home or right. in a palace. Uh, we're just another social club because it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in the midst of His people that brings that evidence, the testimony of Jesus right. into the church. So the Holy Spirit. Many churches don't want the Holy Spirit. Don't want the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Don't want the uh, manifestation of the Spirit of God in their churches. They just want to have church, make everybody feel comfortable. Don't get weird with this Holy Spirit. There's, there's no speaking in tongues, no prophecy, no song of the Lord. Let's just sing a few songs. Uh, matter of fact. Their church is no longer calling it worship. They're now saying, we just sing songs. And uh, this way they can get away with hiring worldly musicians that don't even know Christ because all they want is excellence but don't care for the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, we care for the Spirit. Jeez, we care for the Holy Ghost. We care for that presence of God. And if a musician can't bring up the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we should care less about his talent and his ability and song. We were trained with this. We've trained all of our churches around the world right. with this way. Whether they're 20 people or whether they're uh, 32,000, where they're uh, 70,000, whatever they are in number, there are churches with the Holy Ghost. Yes. And it's a big fat lie that has entered our culture even today by young preachers who think they know better than the past years and they don't think they need the activity or the presence of the Holy Spirit. So all they want to do is create a very comfortable church, sing a few songs, bring your money, and then hear a motivational word and go and be the best you can be. Well, you know, the army can teach you how to be the best you can be. Uh, uh, it's more than just being the best. It's about changing your world. But without the Holy Spirit, we are a crippled church. That's We're a right. church that doesn't have power for anything. We don't have power to see any lives transformed. So the epicenter in the church is the Holy Spirit. And I would contend with any preacher in this generation, having 46 years of serving God and ministering around the world, I would contend with any fool that thinks that he can do church without the Holy Spirit. Come on. That's right. Come on. That's right. Uh, in the family, in the family there's an epicenter. In the family, the father is the epicenter. Mom is the attention draw. Everybody gravitates to mom. God gives moms great grace. But really, when you look at it, it's the father instituted by God and he's the head of the house. He's the head of the woman and he's the, together with his wife, they can make the head of the family. But you extract the father from a family and you will have prisons filled with a fatherless boys. Fatherless young women and young women will fall into the arms of men who will abuse them and hurt them because daddy didn't take his place. The father wasn't there. Even if he was alive and he was there among the family but didn't act like a father, he runs the risk of, of missing out on the biggest thing. He's the epicenter of that family. Everything starts with him. Everything uh, uh, it begins to move with him. If not, thank God for moms who are single and moms who have raised their children, and I don't want to take anything away from that. Uh, you know, we have moms that have raised their children that have done a great job. Right. And God bless you for that. Even when men abandoned you or men mistreated you, you stood your ground and raised your children. Wow. But, but God has an order for everything he does, and he has an epicenter for everything he does. In our home, the table is the epicenter. We think uh, it's all kinds of uh, activities and all that kind of games. Those are all great. And the park activities and, and Disney. And, the, and, uh, and if you look in Orlando, Disney becomes a, a great place to hang out with your family. And Disney Springs and go see movies and check it out. But the greatest place is the table. That's the right. table in your house. When you That's sit right. together, it's also something attacked by the enemy where he's trying to get us so busy. But we don't have time to eat together. Time to fellowship together, the time to talk at the table is the place where conversations go on and it's the, that epicenter of the family. It's where family happens the most is at the table. Well, in marriage, the epicenter of marriage is on it. For those of you who are contemplating marriage and those of you who are thinking about the future, it's honor. 
I'm going to be married 45 years with my wife. And what's kept us is it's not our romance because sometimes we're not so romantic. It's not our feeling good because sometimes we don't feel so good. And it's, it's the honor that we decide to put into our marriage. Uh, I think our marriage probably has been hurt the most when we have failed to honor each other. But when we honor each other, it's what keeps us. When we decide, I'm going to honor you no matter what happens or how I feel, regardless of what happens in my life, I'm going to honor you. Honor is the epicenter of every marriage. Well, the epicenter of receiving is giving. Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. The epicenter of receiving is giving. You want to know? You want to know how to receive? You can't outgive God, but if you never learn the principle of giving, you will never receive. If you've never even can't please God with what He asks you to give, then regardless of all your devotions and everything, you can't even uh, give God in the least. And when I talk about that, I'd like to talk to, uh, to share very bluntly that the time is just a minimum. And God asked for him. Ten cents of every dollar belongs to him. Give it to me. You know why? You show he's the Lord. You show he's in charge. You show that, hey, he's the provider. He gives you access to all 90%. Just remind, remember him as the first one and give him the tithe. Because if not, the Bible says that we steal from God. You know what you steal? You don't steal his money. You steal his opportunity to give to you. Because you have not obeyed God. You have not honored God. Uh, it was Billy Graham who said, if you want to know how much God loves you, read your Bible. If you want to know how much you love God, read your checkbook. <laughs> how much have you given to the kingdom? Are you a tiger? Are you somebody that keeps up with the basics? Tithing is basic for every believer. In our church, we never allowed anybody to exercise any area of ministry if they weren't tithing. An right. usher, take up an offering. Well, the Bible says if you don't tithe, you're a crook and you're robbing God. Well, how can you put a robber to collect money? So they weren't even allowed to usher, greet the door, or anything because they had to be tithing. And every wow. leader had to pastor their own team of people that they had under them as we pastored the church. Well, worship ministry, you want to worship, but you're not a tither? Well, you got to learn how to tithe. Tithe the basic, do the basics first. Get your baptism in order to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, learn uh, how to prophesy and then uh, perfect your music uh, talent and all that. But then be a giver in the house of God because that's the epicenter of receiving. And now you're going to be broke all your life and, and guess what? You'll make your church broke as well because you bring a curse to the whole house of God. Because you're in a place of service but you're not giving to the house of the Lord. So my thing was, hey, if you can't, do the basics, then you don't belong here. And uh, you take a walk, be happy, get whatever you want to get, but I know the principles of giving. I've seen it in my life. I come from a poverty-stricken community, Bariago uh, Chalo, they call it, and it's one of the, uh, the most poorest places. Uh, and I had to shine shoes to go swimming with my brother, make a few cents. Uh, when I was a kid, because my parents couldn't afford to give me money enough to get into a pool uh, that was open. So I had to muster up, go to the plaza and shine polished shoes for people. Uh, as, as early as 11 years old, I was polishing shoes so I could take my younger brother swimming for the day uh, during our time off. So that I could get a little job, make some money. And take well, all of those little things that I washed cars and I had to wash 18 cars a day just to make enough money to, to buy little things in my life because it was two dollars. Imagine washing a car for two dollars, a whole car inside and out. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's what we did, but you know what? I believe God when Jesus came into my life, I recognized that I wasn't called to live that way, that I had prospering, right. that I had to learn the principles of the Word of God. And one of the epicenters of receiving was giving. If I was never became a giver, and I lived selfishly, then I was going to receive. With the same measure you measure, that's, the, that's right. the, what you're going to get measured by. So, uh, the law of sowing and reaping, you reap what you sow. Part of this whole epicenter. Well, the ministry here, in ministry, servanthood is the epicenter. Servanthood. Everything starts out of servanthood. As a matter of fact, the word ministry is the word servanthood. If you don't serve, guess what? You don't get to be in the ministry. If you can't serve, I've had 
The leader, tons of leaders walked with me. I pastored for close to 30 years. And close of leaders who had talent, had ability, could prophesy. That they felt that they had the Holy Spirit, they could move. But they weren't servants. They couldn't clean the church. There was two, it was below them to put chairs or organize chairs or pick up a piece of paper. And I would watch for those things. I might even drop a piece of paper to see if they would pick it up. To <laughs> test them. I would do anything to test the servanthood of somebody. Because if you can't do it, uh, then you're no good. Uh, guys that wanted to be ordained in the ministry. Oh yeah, uh, but before you do that, can you go clean the toilets today? Because I need to rush to the toilets. Oh, but I'm a prophet. Go prophesy to the toilet. But, but whatever you do, learn how to serve. Because in servanthood, every man of God, every great leader, proved himself as a servant. Joshua was a servant of Moses. Elijah was a servant of Elijah. Uh, they were servanthoods that, that God prospered these people and these leaders because they had an attitude of a servant. So in ministry, servanthood is the epicenter. In our fellowship, uh, and we call it fellowship, but how many of you know it's food? Every time we say fellowship, it's because we're going to eat. And Christians don't drink, but we love to eat. Uh, and uh, uh, we love fellowship. Uh, so uh, in success, determination is an empty century. When you get back up, you fall, but you get back up. You fail, but you fail forward. It's that the determination in your life you, that you know what you need to do and it doesn't matter how many times you fail you're going to get back up and attempt it again until you get it right and do it right it's not God's fault, it's more our fault when we mess up, can you say amen? amen. And, uh, so he lets us so see if we're going to have the determination uh, that passion to get up again and do things uh, well, in all of life in greatness, humility is the epicenter you want to be great? The greatest of all will be the servant of all will be the, the Bible says, the natural translation says, will be the slave mm -hmm. of all. Mm -hmm. Slave. That's and that's how you know somebody with a real servant's heart. Mm -hmm. If you treat him like a slave, he doesn't get offended. Mm -hmm. Because he's a servant. He has a slave heart. He doesn't say, you're just using me. No. He's a slave. He's a servant. He lost all his rights. Mm -hmm. He gave up his rights. Mm -hmm. you, somebody who gets offended when you ask them to serve, is a professional servant, okay. yeah. but not doesn't have the humility or the heart of a servant. Wow, wow. that's oh. good. The epicenter of our strength is the joy of the Lord. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. And, and we think it's all many other things, but it's really the joy of the Lord. If you can keep, you can lose everything else, but if you can hold on to the joy of the Lord, it'll strengthen you. It'll pick you back up again. That's it's right. the epicenter of our strength. Well. In all of it, listen to what the Bible has to say about it. That was just a little introduction of rendezvous to take you around this word, where epicenter, where everything starts. In Luke chapter 4, verse 14, speaking now of Jesus, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Listen now, he returned where? In the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. He didn't enter uh, Galilee, or didn't go into Galilee with the power of thinking, uh, uh, mental ascent. He went with the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And then it says in verse 17, And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place. He found the place where it was written. Jesus knew exactly what he was looking for, because he understood this thing about epicenters. And the, the scripture that uh, qualified him to become the preacher, the Son of God at that moment in history, to become the manifestation of God on the face of the earth was this scripture. In verse 18, and when he asked for the scriptures, and it was not a coincidence, God was handing it and taking him to that place of a sovereign encounter with the Word. Because unbeknownst, uh, like to us, many of us, we have a Bible with 66 books that have been put together with chapters and addresses. But in those days, there was no Bible. The only uh, word that they had was the Old Testament, but it was in scrolls. And every Sunday, uh, they would go through the scrolls all year long, picking scrolls that were, had to be read one after another. And when Jesus walked in to the temple by the power of the Spirit, they happened. Not by coincidence, but because God is a God of epicenter, he said, I'm giving you the scripture that qualifies to do what you do. And they handed him the scroll of Isaiah. And then he looked through the scroll and he found the place. 
He need, he needed to find the place. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now this whole scripture about him. And then he goes on to say that today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Well, if you, verse 19 says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He didn't finish the whole verse. If you go to Isaiah, in Isaiah, the same scripture ends with it to declare a day of vengeance of our God. Wow. So he divides the scripture there, and he just says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee, the year of the Lord, the acceptable year, the year of God's favor, and he doesn't read the day of vengeance of our God, because that part he's going to read when he comes back again. Wow. The second coming. That wasn't for that moment. He knew the place, he knew how to understand what time in his life, what time in God's plan he was in. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight. This had to do with his purpose. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. Jesus spent a lot of time in Capernaum because even in Luke chapter 4, you'll read in verse 23 that they said of him, do the works you've done in Capernaum. Do the things you've done in Capernaum. Do them here in your city. And he said the prophet is not welcome in his own city. Uh, he is not received in his own city. But that's what the Pharisees in the synagogue told him. Do what you've done in Capernaum. So we know already he had been to Capernaum. He had already, there were some things that had happened in Capernaum. And now they're saying, do what you've done there. Do it here. Go ahead. Do it here. You're saying that this scripture is fulfilled in your, in, in your eyes. Do here. And they rejected him. They got very angry at him. They wanted to even kill him at that time. But then he went down to Capernaum. Why? Because Jesus found that Capernaum celebrated him. Wow. You can't be in a place you're tolerated. If you want to have success in ministry, success in any other area of your life, Jesus. you got to go where you're celebrated. Come on. Not Jesus. So uh, he went to Capernaum because that's a place that had received this ministry before. And the very Pharisees that were adjuring him were saying, go do what you, what you did in Capernaum. Do it here. Mm. But they had no faith to believe in him or believe that he was the one. So what a choice? I'm going to the place that celebrates. And then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. So much was his impact on, on, on Jesus' life uh, that he began to search the scriptures because if we want to know our epicenter, we're going to have to go back to the Word of God. And listen to what Matthew chapter 4 says. Finding your epicenter. Everybody say, find me. Find your epicenter. You got to find what God said about you so you could find your epicenter. You know the purpose. He knew his purpose. It was up in Isaiah to preach the gospel, to bring recovery, to set the captives free. But now he had to find the place. Many of us have the purpose, but we don't have the place. We still have not found the epicenter. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 17. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Here's Isaiah again. Isaiah had a lot of prophetic words that guided Jesus in his ministry. Uh, spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, the Lord of Zebulun, the land of Zebulun, forgive me, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea. He, listen, if they had zip codes, he would have given them a zip code. <laughs> God was placing it strategically in a place. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, which was Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. 
and upon those who sat in the region, and a shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he had been in Capernaum, he had done works in Capernaum, but here in Matthew, it says that when they took John into prison, Jesus went to Capernaum. Now, many theologians will write and make annotations that he was afraid of being put into prison and, uh, and uh, he, that he would have the same uh, consequences that John had. Now, Jesus was very wise, and if you know you're going to be persecuted, you know, God didn't call you to be dumb. Uh, he called you to be wise, and if you know that there is persecution, you need to be able to get to a place, again, uh, a place that can receive you. Uh, so, Jesus went to Capernaum. He went to Capernaum, but he found in the scriptures, in the book of Isaiah, again, the direction that gave him where he needed to go to start his ministry. There were going to be miracles, there were going to be signs and wonders, and Isaiah speaks in a past tense. The people who sat in darkness, people who were sitting in darkness, have seen a great light. He was speaking of Jesus. Jesus, you're going to be the light to those people who sat in darkness. And upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. It doesn't seem like the nicest community. It doesn't seem like the nicest place. People are in darkness, sitting in darkness, and they're actually uh, in the region of the shadow of death. These are people who are destined to die in the shadow of death. But Jesus was going to change all that. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Once he found the direction where God was calling, he knew his purpose. Now he needed to find his place. And he found his place. He found his purpose because there was one thing he found before that. His prophetic word. you got to find your prophetic word so you can find your purpose, so you can find your place. God is very detailed about giving instructions. And he wants to guide us to the right place, the right people. Uh, and just because there's a need doesn't mean that you're called to fulfill. The Bible speaks about this when he says, there were many widows in Seraphim. But only to one was Elijah sent. Wow. That widow became the epicenter for Elijah. She would take care of it. There's a place. Just because there are many needs doesn't mean you're all over the place. And many people want to do ministry everywhere. And it's great. God can use us. But the reality is there's a place where things start. We will give you your greatest success. That's great. And make, uh, make you... Uh, noticeable. The news of you will go out through the region. Come on. Because you found your epicenter. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. 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 So, uh, Isaiah 55, and this is the burden of the Lord on me this morning. I think it was here as we sang about finding the Lord. Isaiah 55, verse 6 through 7, listen to Isaiah, this great prophet. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I like that. He abundantly pardons. He forgives immensely. It doesn't matter what we're guilty of, when you come, when you turn back to God, he forgives us. But this starts with this, this phrase, seek the Lord while he may be found. Well, can't he be found all the time? <laughs> call upon him while he is there. Well, can we call upon him at every time? You can. But there are those moments when God draws near. There are those moments when Elijah comes to the widow. There are those moments when Jesus moves into Capernaum and makes it his city. Wow. That's the place and the time where Capernaum needed to respond to God. They needed to respond. The people of Capernaum city in darkness would see and recognize a great light. There are moments that God shows up in our lives, but we're too busy to discern him. Wow. We're too busy to find out that, hey, he's here. You better call him now. It might not look like the most greatest place, but because God's presence comes, it changes everything. Come on. He's the changer. He brings change to everything. So let him, uh, and then it goes on, let the wicked forsake his way. Because any way that is not God's way for us is a wicked way. It's an interruption of God's perfect will, even if it's a good idea. God gives instructions, not ideas. Ooh. And every time you think that God's giving you ideas, 
You need to go back and find out for the instructions. God, it seems good, but what's your instruction? Come on. Because you speak clearly. You don't leave anything have said. Uh, and so good. the unrighteous man, his thoughts, because our thoughts can confuse us and take us to places we never were meant to be, uh, engage us with people we were never meant to be engaged with. We can end up in the wrong place because of our wrong thinking. That's why it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So you and I need to be transformed in our thinking. Our thoughts can take us to places, but if you want to prove what the will of God is, what did God call you for? What is his purpose? What is his plan? Where is the place? Get rid of your thoughts and get his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Thank God we can always return to him. And he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We all have made mistakes. We all will continue to make mistakes. Uh, but you need to get back up, turn back to God and say, God, I messed up. My thinking was wrong. My attitude was wrong. My, my giving was wrong. Everything that's wrong will fix it in your life so you can get back to the place that God has set for you. God orchestrates and leads the supernatural. He's a sovereign God, connects us to places with purpose. We might not see it all at the beginning, but it's what God does. That's right. So uh, listen, what God said to, to Elijah, go to the widow, because I've already taken, talk, talk to her about it. She didn't have a clue. God said, I've already taken care of it. I've already prepared it. But when she, when he came to the widow, she was looking to die. I'm collecting my last uh, one here to have my last meal, and me and my boy are going to eat, and we're going to die. That doesn't sound like somebody who's prepared for Elijah, I've been waiting for you. A miracle's going to take place. No, she wasn't ready. Elijah had to have the faith, because it's your faith Come on, say that changes Jesus. an ordinary place into the epicenter of God. Wow. Wow. When you arrive at the place that God gives you with your faith, wow. Then even those that are negative, they don't understand why you're there. Why are they here? <laughs> I tell you, the first street service Come on. in our church, Come on. Danny got saved in our first street service That's right. in Harlem, New York City. It was on the streets. People weren't doing this before me. Uh, they would have preachers in corners, but I'm talking about full service. Musicians, singers, chairs, everything. We closed down the blocks, put stacked speakers as far as we could get them, and <laughs> blasted the community. We got sound permits. We did it all legally. But for six blocks, you could hear our worship. For six blocks, you could hear prophecy. For six blocks. And then six blocks is, a, is populated by a lot of people in New York City. And the pastors came to see during the day what I was doing. And I was in shorts. I was a lot younger, of course. I would look like one of the kids. And they, I was 30, 30 years old? 33. 33. 34, actually. Yeah. So I was young. I still am here. And uh, I, I, I still look young. My body looks young, you know? I try to do it now, but it's a lot harder. Um, <laughs> they say 60s is a new 40, but somebody's going to explain it to my mind. Uh, <laughs> so I'm in love with putting chairs up. I'm serving, making sure everything is ready because we're about to start our service. And people are arriving. Danny was just arriving from England. They had picked up at, his air, at the airport. His brother was driving into the church because his brother had not saved in our church. Well, we, we had a small group of people. And the pastors were all there. Pastors from the community came out. And they all knew each other. But I didn't know them. They didn't know me. I was new. Mm -hmm. So they started talking about the pastor who was doing the activity. And I'm in the midst. I'm hearing everything. And I'm just not saying anything. I'm, I look like a hippie among them. And that they're, they're talking about who they think they are. And which, who's God? What's the pastor here? And how dare he come and do this and close the streets? And we've never done this before. And they're criticizing me. Look at all these musicians. Some of them have long hair. And people with tattoos. And they were criticizing everything they saw. We set up shop. And when I announced myself, they stood there to see they announced myself they felt so foolish because they had been talking all afternoon about me. Right with me, Stanley Buzzard. <laughs> so the presence of God came down, people got saved. It was a powerful encounter with God. Um, and I harvested my, my son in law, your pastor, that day. It, was, right. it became the epicenter of everything that would happen in our ministry. God began to grow. Let's go back to the scripture, Isaiah 50, 
45, 15, listen to this scripture, because when we talk about seeking while he may be found, you can't ignore this scripture. Truly you are the God, and this is Isaiah, the great prophet, you are the, the God who hide yourself. O oh God of Israel, the Savior. You're the God who hides. Uh, Isaiah knew him as the God who hides. You hide yourself. You're still the Savior. Oh God, you're God of Israel. You're the Savior. But I know that you like to hide. You're the God who hides. I don't know if you've ever been there, but you will if you haven't. The times when God hides. Where he doesn't mean he's not present. You just can't see him. He's hiding. And you're asking, what are you doing? How come this is happening to me? Why have all this been falling on me? Why has everything gone wrong? It's because he's hiding to see what your attitude. Will you trust him even when you can't see him? Will you trust him when things go wrong? Well, Job said it probably even in a more fuller way. Listen to what he says in Job chapter 23, verses 8 through 10. Look, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive it. You can go forward and not see God. You can go backward. And there are times when you have to go backward. There are times when you start something, but God says, no, I want you to go back. And he takes you backward so that he can show you some things about it. So test your life. I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. And when he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows, I like verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So God hides. But he doesn't mean it. His eyes are not on you. You can't see him, but he can see you. He can look at you, see you. He knows the way you take. He knows everything about you. He knows a word before it's on your tongue. He knows the thoughts of your heart. He knows. He's the God who knows. He's the God who knows the end from the beginning. He, he, you can go forward, but he's hiding. Backward, you think, where are you? And he's there. Left hand, I can't see him. And then left hand, on the right, I can't see him either. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, when God disappears, when you think he's hiding, he's really watching to see what your next reaction will be. What will be your reaction in the time of the test? And everyone will have to go through it. Can I take it back to Capernaum for a little bit? All right, because Capernaum is interesting. Because the home of Jesus, Capernaum was called the village of comfort. That's how it was known. That's what it actually means, village of comfort. Description of comfort uh, of Capernaum. Capernaum is the first century settlement located on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. The epicenter of Jesus' ministry, the location of most of his miracles. Most of his miracles. About 80% of the miracles that Jesus did in three and a half years of ministry happened in this city of Capernaum. He preached in many other cities, but they all, this became the epicenter because he had a prophecy that pointed him to that place, the city, by the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the prophet Isaiah said. Right there, the land of Bethlehem. And he went there and built his ministry there. Listen, and Capernaum was also known as a bustling fishing center. That's why Peter and his brothers had moved from their home city to Capernaum a couple of years before. History has it that a couple of years before Jesus arrived, Peter and his brothers and his family, with their fishing business, moved to Capernaum because there was a fishing epicenter. That was a place where they could catch more fish and, do, and have a good living. So in Capernaum, guess who's called? Peter, Andrew, James, John, who were all fishermen, joined Jesus as his disciples. Matthew, who was a tax collector, also joined him. There was so much business in that place that they made it a district for collecting taxes. And everybody had to pay taxes. All the fishermen that had all these increase had to pay taxes. And Jesus made Capernaum his home because he knew he would turn fishermen into fishers of men. So he had to go where the fishermen were. He understood what God had called him to do. So the gospel references of Capernaum are 16 times its references in 
But it is not mentioned in the rest of the New Testament. The gospel also speak of Jesus, the mother, having been in Capernaum. Uh, and it, it demonstrates also in Matthew chapter 17 that Jesus was a good citizen of the town of Capernaum. Jesus paid the, the temple taxes there in Capernaum. Remember when somebody said, you have to pay taxes? He said, go throw your hook in the, in the ocean and bring me a fish. And they brought him the fish. And that's one fish. That's all he needed. But he knew exactly what to do. He opened the fish's mouth and found a coin. And Caesar's face what it was on it. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He paid his taxes for his own. Jesus was a citizen, became a citizen of Capernaum. He could have lived anywhere in the region. He was born in Nazareth. Could have stayed there. He was Jesus of Nazareth. He was never Jesus of Capernaum, but Capernaum is called the city of Jesus. Wow. Let me show you. And it's the Sea of Galilee. It's the district. It's a very famous place. What am I getting at? Where am I taking you? I'm taking you to as a church, your home right now. And I believe God's testing this house. Wow. And there might be moments still of God hiding. Uh, when you hide and go seek, seeking to see and testing your faith. But when you come to your epicenter, everything that God said will begin to happen because there is an epicenter that God has chosen for this particular group of faith, people, of church that make up a global church. In John chapter 6, verse 24, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, they're looking for him, they're looking for miracles, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum. Seeking Jesus. Everybody, soon, everybody found out. He's not here, he's got to be a cow. Because that's his home. Then you find this scripture in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, openly says, So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. What was his own city? Capernaum. Mm -hmm. Capernaum was the city of Jesus. It was his city. He was preaching in different regions, did ministry in other places, but he always would come back home to his own city, Capernaum. Well, let me give you a download of, you can take a picture of this or ask me later, I'll pass it to you. <laughs> Jesus performed the following miracles in Capernaum. The coin in the mouth of the fish, Capernaum. Uh, he healed Jairus' daughter in Capernaum. That was a centurion. Uh, he healed a woman with the issue of blood. Capernaum, that we hear so many preachers preach about. The fed 5,000 people, and that's just a man. They didn't count the children, but it could, could have been 15,000 in Capernaum. Wow. Caught a miraculous amount of fish, Capernaum. Healed the demon possessed man, Capernaum. Healed Peter's mother in law. A lot of people think that's why he did, Peter denied him three times, because he healed his mother in law. Uh, healed Peter's mother in law. That happened in Capernaum. Because they had moved to Capernaum. Heal a paralytic in Capernaum. Heal the centurion's servant in Capernaum. The man with a paralyzed hand was likely also healed in Capernaum. All of those gospel things in the, in, the, in the four gospels talk about all the miracles that Jesus did in Capernaum. And the majority of his miracles were done there because he was celebrated there. Wow. He was received there. Wow. It was the people that God had ordained for him to reach. It was the people of prophet Isaiah. Well, they're sitting in darkness, but they're going to see the light. My God. Preach. Come on. Come on, preach. preach. You might go to a place that doesn't look like a place, but you've got to know what the place is. And that's the people. That's the purpose. That's the place. The purpose dictates the place. Um, oh my God. Let me say it this way. Your strength dictates your purpose. And your purpose dictates a place that God's chosen for you. So many people want to be good at everything mm -hmm. that they forsake their major strength. Wow. And their strength actually is what dictates their purpose. The strength of Jesus was that he was anointed mm -hmm. and that miracles followed him. He had, he had the power to change the life of the poor. Mm -hmm. All the poor hear the gospel. The good news. What's good news to the poor? You don't have to say poor. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's good news to the poor. Hey, it ends here. Your poverty ends here. This is the poorest day of your life. The gospel has come to you. Yes. Come that's on. what the gospel yes. does. Yes. 
oh, we're trying to get so spiritual it's because God is going to set them free. No, he's going to do all that. But he's going to freight them from their poverty. Come, Come on. on. That's right. So the gospel can change. Harlem, New York City, and we saw it. That's transform. Right. That's right. I believe we were a seed that God sowed in that community. Today, if you walk the streets of Harlem, what was to be a shootout place for us, where we had to hide with our families behind cars when we came out of church, today is a bustling community That's of right. doctors and professionals all That's over the right. place. That's right. That's right. It's change. Who changes that? I've watched it over and over again in my history with the church and my pastors who have taken different cities and turned them around. Come on. Well, I don't know what God's going to use. I don't know the epicenter yet. I believe God's going to reveal that to Danny and Erica. And I, I believe it's probably spoken about it. We need to go back to all of our prophecies and search them and see. Did anybody say anything about this? Is there something about this part? And what does this describe? Let's go back and examine the word careful. Because yes. mm -hmm. if it's going to be a Spanish church, then we need to be in a Spanish community. But if it's not going to be a Spanish church and the call of God is for a multicultural ministry, Come on, which right. I happen to believe that's what this church is called to do, yes. that's right. then you can't lock yourself into a Spanish church. No matter who wants to say, well, you're not saying Spanish songs, I believe you. Why? Because I, you know, we, we'd love to please you. You stick around with a nice little bonito for you. But we're not going to forsake the epicenter, the call of God, what God called us to do. If you want to raise a multi a cultural church and maybe reach the black community, then you can think of the black community. But God can't do that. I'm not saying God can't. But I know the DNA of this church is multicultural. That's right. The DNA of this church is reaching this the world in our city to reach the cities of the yes. world. Yes. It's reaching every single person of different cultures where they can come together in one common language and worship God. Come on. Right. We can have whole groups that meets the needs. That doesn't mean we don't meet the needs of different cultures. But you know, above my black and culture and my rice and bean culture is the kingdom culture. That's right. All right? It's a kingdom culture. Well, you know, people in Greece tell me, well, our culture is about drinking and alcohol. Well, you're an alcoholic and you're a worship leader. And your excuse is that you're it's your culture. That's why you drink. No, then how about thinking about the kingdom culture? That's right. That's right. Coming apart from the world. The kingdom culture is above. It trumps, and no, no pun intended here. It trumps <laughs> uh, uh, our culture, our, our culture. Thank God for cultural yes. values. Thank God we will yes. give that we're just we don't we'll all look alike. Uh, we all have different distinctions. That's what makes the house of God beautiful. Yes. Come on. But somehow we got stuck in cultural, pleasing cultural mindsets. Come on. That even now the church is falling back into a cultural mindset. We got to build a church that's culturally relevant, and we forget the reverence of the kingdom culture. Yes. So now we're trying to ease everybody. Let everybody come. Yeah, that's a, like we got to make room for the homosexuals. They got to be in the ministry of the church. No, they got to come to Christ. Just like any sinner, like the adulterer, like the throat, like the murderer. We have room for everybody. That's everybody right. can come. They got to repent. Come on. But they got to repent. And they got to right. love Jesus right. before they can go on and life. We're not here to sing kumbaya songs and, and hold hands and never change our lives. We're here to be transformed and change our city. That's right. Amen. So we got to catch the vision clearly and we've got to go back and research it. This, listen, people, sometimes people are not patient. Because it takes time to find that epicenter. My God. Yes. Um, Jesus didn't find his epicenter until he was 30. Wow. He could have started as a young man. He did miracles. His mother knew he had the power to work miracles. That's why she invited him to the wedding of Canaan, because he had done miracles before. Wow. And she was running out of wine. I know you could turn water into wine. I see you do it. <laughs> but he didn't start his ministry until it was the right time. But yeah. when he found the word, his, he found his epicenter, and he found mm -hmm. that That's the right. purpose, the place, because he found the prophecy that spoke of those things. And then, you know, he had the patience, if you could add that to the peace, mm -hmm. to wait for God and say, God, it's okay. Wow. We'll have a church at home yeah. until you go open the way to the epicenter. Yes. I'll close with this. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 2. Awesome. So good.
And again, he entered Capernaum. Now, this feels like almost like he's been visiting Capernaum. And again, he entered Capernaum. After some days, this puts a, z a seal on what I'm saying. And it was heard that he was in the house. Whose house? His house. <laughs> Jesus had a house. That's right. And it was a house with an ocean view. Like the Sea of Galilee. He positioned himself to fulfill his word. Um, if I'm a rich fisherman, I can't be uptown. I gotta be downtown with it. I gotta be by the seashore. I'm gonna buy a house. I gotta buy a house there. I'm gonna live as close as possible so I can reach those fishermen I'm watching uh, fishing. And can you imagine Jesus moving his stuff into that house? We don't know if he bought it, leased it, whatever. He was he had a house in Capernaum. And it wasn't a big place. He didn't have you didn't have a wife, he didn't have children. But he got this big place because he had a big plan. That's right. Come on. And I'm saying he had a big house because this verse proves that he had, it was a big house for an ocean view. It wasn't a cheap, well, I'm going to start ministry. Well, let's invest the least as possible because we don't know. Now, Jesus went and bought the best place he could buy with the best view he could buy so mm -hmm. people wouldn't want to be at his house. That's and right. he bought a big house for a group of people because there was going to be a party that was going to start there that was going to end. Every time he was in the home, things would begin to happen. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. It was heard Hoover, hmm. everybody in the community, his disciples, his people, that he was meeting with them in the house before. This is his cell group, his home group. They were meeting in the houses, was church on Sunday. On Saturday, he was in the synagogue, but on Sunday, he had church with everybody. And during the week, he was in the house. Jesus. It, it says immediately. Many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. Somebody say immediately. immediately. That means there was an urgency. I can't wait for Jesus to get home. Uh, he's traveling. He's out preaching, but he came back from the trip of preaching. Let's go. Man, we're going to have church today. Uh, we're going to a building? No, no. It's going to be in his house. He's got a cool house. And, and <laughs> they all met in his house. They were all going to worship in his house, in the house of Jesus. Come on. Think about it. It's Carla singing her song and our guitar. Jesus, the presence of Jesus in Jesus' house. Yes. Yeah. They found out he was in the house. Somebody say he's in the house. He's, he's in, in the, the house. house. He's in the house. Immediately, that puts the urgency. They dropped whatever they were doing. Jesus is back. Oh wait a minute. Come on. I, Come I, on. This has got to wait. I got to receive Jesus. They immediately gathered together so that they're was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. He preached what? The, the word. word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, somebody say the crowd. The crowd. How many think it's a big house if there's a crowd? Yeah. Yeah. They had covered the roof where he was, so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, somebody say, he saw their faith. Their he saw faith. their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their heads immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus with themselves. He said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? What he's saying is that you haven't learned anything. You're the experts of the law, and you still can't get it. You think you know God because you know the letter of the law, but you've missed the spirit of the law. Wow. Come on, preach. Wow. Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier? And I like that phrase. Which is easier? Would you say that with me? Which is easier? Which, Which is easier? easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise and take up your bed, and go to your house. My so that you might know that he has the power to forgive sins. There's a purpose behind miracles. Miracles happen. So that people can see that God is a God. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to draw this down to this. This is Capernaum. It would be the place, it was known as the place of comfort. 
But that's what Jesus said. Mm. We're going to have church in this place. That's right. I'm going to buy you a house. I'm going to invest some money. It takes money to build a church. This church is gathering. As soon as God shows you, he said, we're going to need to come up with tithes and offerings. But if you're not tithing now, not practicing now, we won't be ready for when we get the property. That's we got to start now. We don't have anything because we believe in the principle. That's because right. I'm a tithe. I'm the, I'm the first tithe in this house. Out of every single cent that comes into my home from travel, there's a check here supporting this house. Yes. But I can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We all need you to put it here. This is your house. You call it. It's not, hey, we love you. Come visit us once in a while. But you don't need to walk with us. If you can't believe in this vision to invest yourself in it, then listen, we're not going anywhere with you. You're not helping us get anywhere. But if you're going to go to the future with us, we got to stand together. we got to stand right. united. we got to be givers together. we got to know the epic center. And when we find it, there's no question about we're going there. No, that's where God wants us. We're going there. It doesn't matter what you do. Can I tell you, the team that I started with in Harlem came from everywhere else but Harlem. That's right. Came from everywhere else. It wasn't the Harlemites. They came from Queens. They came from Brooklyn. They came from Red Hook. They came from everywhere else. <laughs> My musicians came from different places. But none of them from Harlem. But you know what? They bought the vision. They said, Pastor, we're going. Wherever you're at, wherever God's called you to do, we want in on this thing. We want in on the epicenter. If that's what you say, that's what God showed you. Let's go. We went, it took us a few months to build the first sanctuary. We had to reconstruct everything, build this whole thing because it was a, an abandoned room that was pretty disgusting. And we had to make it look right so people would come because we wanted to reach people. So it took us a lot of work. I even suffered a heart attack doing it. God raised me, and the next time I was preaching again. But God does great things, and these guys were all sold out. They sold everything they had and believed God. They believed, they pushed hard with me. They gave of their life, their time, their talents. And we built one of the greatest churches in America that touched them. Out of that, many churches have tried. Out of there, I have the authority to speak the pastors around the world. From Asia to Singapore to Malaysia to Cuba to Latin America, up uh, to Trinidad and to the island of Puerto Rico from South to North. West, the east, the whole of the island of Puerto Rico, all over different parts of Latin America, Costa Rica, different places, Guatemala, everywhere. Why? We started about the other century. All it cost us. We had to pay a price. Many tears. We had a bit of up and downs. We suffered all kinds of stuff. But we needed to experience God. He was the only one who could forgive them of their sins. So when Harlem was a terrible place to live and nobody wanted to live there because you were, but was incorporated, was waiting to come outside the door of your house. And we had pastors and people and mugged and women that left our coffee house and got beaten. Uh, and uh, how we would reach it? Right in the corners and the door steps of our church, people were pushing drugs. At that time, TNT, which was the drug force that Giuliani put together, was busting people on the streets of my, uh, on my, uh, my church. And they were to let us out until they wrapped things up. And sometimes there were bodies laid out. They had shot them right on the place. I had hit them and killed people on the streets of my church. They became deacons in my church. They came back to the place of their crime, God saved, and served the Lord. We had a woman that jumped out of a building in Harlem right after 9 11. Depression came in. She was so depressed, she jumped out of a high floor in the 30s. The wind was so strong, it blew her into a few floors underneath her apartment, and she fell on a, on a lawn chair. <laughs> she tried to commit suicide, couldn't even kill herself. <laughs> you know where she ran with her whole family the next, that was Saturday, Sunday, she was in church. Gave her life to the Lord, became one of our servants in the house of God. Today is still serving God in our church. Well, I don't know if we get it. But I like the question of Jesus to the religious people of his day. Why are you so surprised by this? 
that I told him his sins are forgiven. And this power of man, who you've passed so many times, never cared to see them heal, never stopped to pray for him. You've seen him forever. But these guys picked him up. You know why they picked him up? They ran with him. They got, in picking him up, they got late to the meeting. If you're going to be late, at least make it count. <laughs> they came late, but they got so much faith. They were bringing somebody that never came. Jesus. And they couldn't get them in the doors or the windows, so they went up to the roof, and the roof was made of mud, and they started digging up the roof, broke the roof, and Jesus was watching them. He was preaching the word to them. He's watching them. And dirt's falling all over the place. And, and <clears throat> they lower and finally the ropes, and there's this paralytic guy scooped out of his mind because these guys ran so fast with him they almost killed him on the way. He was paralytic, at least I'm alive. You know, but they're carrying him, bouncing him. Now they take him to the roof and drop him through the roof of a house that's packed with people. He's not even dressed for the occasion. He's paralyzed. Who knows what he was wearing that day is he couldn't even take care of himself. He probably delivered him to the same spot every day. Now he's picked up by had faith. And can you pick him up? Break the roof. Lower him down, Jesus said. Because of your faith, these your sins are forgiven. The actions of this church, the actions of faith, will define the epicenter. Your faith will cause the sins of many to be forgiven. And not only that, that's when you will begin to see the miracles that you've heard from God. Because then you will say, what's easier? To see their sins forgiven? To see the paralytic get up his chair? To see the blind recover his sight? To see the demon possessed set free? I guarantee you the future of this church is great. I think I believe God with all my heart. I've watched this over and over again. This is, we've seen this. We've walked through it. We've just got to press it, be determined. So we can have what God said about us. Let's find the happy center. Let's find that place. And while we're looking, let's enjoy God. Let it test us. Go ahead. Let's play hide and seek. But I'm going to show up every Sunday. I'm going to show up with my time. I'm going to show up with my faith. I'm going to be there. I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to be transformed by your presence. I'm going to do everything in my life so that I'm not the same as I used to be. I'm going to be ready. For the epicenter. I will be ready for the supernatural. So God help us. Help us to understand that you've got places in mind. That you have a place chosen for the influence of this church. These believers that have gathered here in your name. You've already got a place. Help us to find it. Help us not to lose hope. Help us not to lose faith. Help us to believe in investing ourselves. And when we find it, we will invest our money, our time, and our ability to move to that place that you would want us. Many, many people, sins will be forgiven, and many miracles will follow after that. Knowing that we're in the epicenter, Lord, and everything is easier in the epicenter. Thank you. I pray that you bring a conviction in our hearts. Whatever it is that we have not done, whatever it is that we need to do, help us to muster up the faith and the courage to do it. And to rise up and believe you again. Forgive us if we have fallen short. Forgive us if we have put other things before you and your plan. We recognize you brought us together for a purpose. We also recognize that you brought people that were not meant to go with us to the epicenter. We just bless them today. And we ask that you be with them, encourage them, and strengthen them. Let them be used as they find the place where you call them to serve. But help us yes. to go together in spirit of heaven, spirit of faith. Yes. Expecting, expecting that you will do great wonders among us. Bless Danny and Erica. Yes. Pray for Erica's health, Lord God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. We know that you've healed, you've touched, you've 
know that these symptoms will be gone for God. Oh, the of all of these steroids will be gone. She'll be back preaching, sharing, and yes. meeting up with her husband. This church students at the yes. sanctuary. We thank you for the future. It's bright. We thank you for there are things that you will do that we could not imagine. To help our faith to be able to think far beyond the present into the future. And may we arrive at our epicenter. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. My pleasure uh, to be with you guys and just share this time with you doing something great. Don't lose hope. Things will change in God's time Amen. and in God's place. Amen. Amen. Well, so thank you for receiving me. Amen. 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 Okay. One of the songs that we sang before. Um, what an awesome word about epicenter. Finding yourself in the middle of God's will is so important. Finding that right place. And uh, today we're just going to take up our tithe and our offering today. If, you're, if you count yourself a part of this house, I want to thank you for those of you who have been faithful to get it. If you're watching online and you want to partner with us, we invite you to partner with us. Come out. You know, showing up is half the battle. It was written that there were some people that they were dressed for war, but they never showed up. They forgot to be in the epicenter of what God was doing in their time. And today, you can be in the center of what God wants to do with your giving and showing up with your tithe and your offering. And if you don't have anything to give, just show up. What we have, when we come together, do not forsake the gathering of the Sunday. So, if you need a tithe envelope, raise your hand. If not, you can go to the uh, Carol's Factory website, thecarol'sfactory.com, and go to Generous Living. Because we believe in a generous people. And in that, you can give your time and offering to our, our PayPal uh, access point. And we just invite you to.